May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So it turns out that Jesus has no reputation at all. His reputation has been destroyed in the eyes of everyone except Herod. Isn't that strange? The religious authorities despise Jesus. His own family think he's gone crazy and have previously organized an intervention to try and get Jesus to stop what he's doing. And then last week we discovered that even in his hometown, all those people who loved him best, nearest and dearest, the, all the people that watched him grow up, that were friends with his family, they hear him preaching in the synagogue and they say, we don't believe this guy at all. So Jesus' reputation is in tatters at this point. And lo and behold, we discover that he's got a big fan in King Herod. Now, watch what Mark does here. This story, this whole passage, is sandwiched in Mark's gospel between the sending of the disciples and their return and the report they give to Jesus about what they did when they were on their missionary journey after Jesus sent them out two by two to go and do his work in all of the neighboring towns. Sandwich between their coming and going, well, actually, sandwich between their going and their coming is this text. And if this was a TV show or a movie, the bulk of today's text would be a flashback. So just watch out for the different time zones here. It starts out with King Herod, knowing he's killed John the Baptist. King Herod hears about Jesus and is intrigued by him and says, it's John the Baptist come back to life. And then at that moment, the flashback begins. Here's the backstory. Mark gets the backstory just a wee bit wrong. It's basically historically true. Uh, we actually have an account of this from an early Jewish historian called Josephus, who I've got to confess, is not the most trustworthy historian that ever lived. He, he had a, he had a, a, a plan. He, he had a checkered life. Um, he wasn't independent. His hands weren't clean, but, but there is a Jewish historian, Josephus, whose writings survive, and, and he pretty much corroborates what Mark is saying. Historians can kind of corroborate it too, except where Mark gets things a little wrong. Um, the daughter um, of King Herod is named Salome. And Herodias... Uh, is not married to Philip. She was married to another one of Herod's half-brothers. Actually, Salome, the daughter, is the one that marries another half-brother whose name is Philip. I'm just telling you this in case you like historical facts to be thrown in and sprinkled amongst your scripture. In fact, another interesting historical fact, um, Herod doesn't survive on the throne much longer than this story we're hearing. Um, Herod, about probably in his 50s by the, at the time of this incident, um, and let me just get the year right. I think it's 39. Oh, it is. I'm right. Amy, write this down. I got something right. In the year AD 39, King Herod is knocked off of his throne uh, by his former father-in-law. See, Herod was previously married before he married Herodias. And the person he, he was married to is the daughter of a neighboring powerful king. And he just dismissed his first wife and sent her back home to her father. Her father promptly took her back home, then invaded, battled against Herod, and threw Herod off his throne. Last historical fact, King Herod isn't a king. His father, Herod the Great, was a king. Herod is only a tetriarch. He, he has two little regions. One of them is Galilee. So he's not even really a king. So as you read this text, you, you should read it along the lines of King Herod. 
What's going on in this text? I think there's more than meets the eye. Remember the other week when we heard about Jarius' daughter, Jarius, the leader of the synagogue, who asks Jesus to cure his daughter? By the time Jesus gets to the daughter, she's dead, and Jesus raises her from the dead? There are words used to describe her as a young woman. It's specific Greek that could mean very young woman. And tradition says, well, Scripture says 12 years old. The same Greek used to describe the 12-year-old young girl that was raised from the dead by Jesus is the same Greek that's used in Mark's gospel to describe Salome, the daughter of Herod and Herodias. Artists have pictured Salome as a temptress, a seductress, that the dance she did was erotic and bewitching, and Herod falls for it. But this, historians believe, could have been a childish dance of a 12-year-old girl that just captured Herod's heart. It would certainly explain why when Herod says, what do you want? And she goes to her mother, and her mother tells her the head of John the Baptist, it's entirely possible that this innocent little girl is just caught up in power dynamics just says, yeah, that sounds like fun. And, and childishly says, oh, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Actually, it's a big board upon which food at banquets were, were presented. That makes it sound a little different than we normally hear the story. Uh, Mark and Josephus only agree on one other thing. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus says that John the Baptist was beheaded for political reasons. Mark reveals it to be family reasons, lustful reasons, embarrassment reasons, religious reasons. The other parts of the text I will rattle through quickly. You will find them in my weekly devotions that get published every week um, in connections. I've already told you that the account is sandwiched between Jesus sending the twelve on their mission and them coming back. Herod serves as a warning. His emotional swings are extreme. You know, one minute he just loves this Jesus, loves this John, loves the message that's being proclaimed, but then his mood swings and all his best intentions go flying out the window. What we remember him for is not his intentions, but the result of his actions. When Herod is deeply grieved by the death of John the Baptist, that's the same Greek that's used in Mark's gospel for Jesus being deeply grieved in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a powerful word, a powerful emotion, and the two make us think of each other. John serves as a symbol of courage and honesty in the face of criticism and danger. Mark's repeated use of the word for, I mean, if you wanted to do a drinking game, not that you would, you're all nice people, but if you wanted to develop your own drinking game on this gospel text, uh, you could take a shot every time you hear the word for. But the word for in, in Greek um, is a preparatory word for an explanation. And so many scholars believe that this is a story that Mark needs to explain the meaning of to his audience. They don't know it already. He's not just, he's giving an explanation of John's death, not just a description of it. In classic Greek versus Hellenic Greek, ancient Greek versus biblical Greek, there used to be two words for birthdays. One for your birthday, you know, your natal day, the, the day you were born and everyone wishes you a happy birthday, and another word for birthday that means the memorial day of your birth. You're now dead, but you're being remembered on your birthday. By the time classic Greek gives way to Hellenic Greek, it's the same word that means either a memorial or a celebration. 
So when Herod allows all this to happen on his birthday party, our ancient forebears heard two meanings there. The celebration of a birth and the memorial of the dead. For that reason, and hence the title of today's sermon, some scholars call this a banquet of death. Okay, so that's where my prepared sermon ends. That, that, was, that was what I had for you. I was going to do a few arms and legs here and there, as is my wont. Far be it from me to ever deliver a short, concise sermon. <laughs> but after the events of last night, hearing, hearing that first lesson that Amos of desolation and destruction, hearing, hearing a, 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 an account of the banquet of death in the gospel today, and knowing what transpired last night, an assassination attempt on live television, that people gunned down, people dead and injured and now fighting for their lives, and there were kids in that audience, both those watching on TV and those physically there, now traumatized. A peaceful event and death and destruction and violence just pops up like that. The, the scripture texts for today are appropriate, I think. How did we get here? What happened to the way people talk to each other that leads to this? Now, now don't get me wrong. The murderer will probably turn out to be either a fanatic or someone who's mentally ill. Because the violence that rhetoric leads us to seldom happens amongst us. when we start to normalize violence and hatred and retribution, when anger becomes our default setting, when scowling is our resting face, it impacts those who are weak and vulnerable or ill. We don't go out and do that stuff. But they do because of what we've said or done, because of the environment that we've helped create, the way we've normalized things that our parents would have been horrified by. In fact, go back in a time machine, try telling your parents what it's like now, they would call you a liar to your face. They wouldn't imagine that our civil discourse could be so uncivil but it also poisons us. I mean, it poisons us in that larger sense that I've just described, even though we're not the ones that will engage in that kind of violence, but it, it affects us because it poisons our relationships. We really are, each of us, the D's and the R's, the donkeys and the elephants. We're vastly different people. I remember a few months ago speaking to someone in the congregation who's a very good friend, love him to bits. And we were talking about prayers. And, and he said, well, that, that prayer's okay, but how come we never pray for? And then he rattled off very passionately, but very appropriately. I can't remember how many, three or four or five things that were weighing heavily on his mind three or four or five of the most important civil and political things on his heart. They weren't even on my radar, you know? These were three or four of the most important things in his life. They didn't even make it in the top 50 of mine. I mean, night and day, I had no idea that he or anyone else particularly was nowhere in my line of sight. 
nowhere close to my heart, never in my thoughts. We were so far apart. And I was shocked in that moment because I kind of knew his politics and I think he kind of knew mine, but I didn't know we were so far apart. I really thought we were closer together than that. St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church has been blessedly spared a lot of the anger and division that other churches have had to endure or have been destroyed by. It comes at the cost of us keeping quiet. It comes at the price of us keeping our mouths shut. And sometimes that's a price I'm willing to pay. There have been times where I've been pretty unauthentic because I know I'm just not going to go there. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to intervene. I'm not going to raise my flag up. I'm not going to reveal myself. I'm just going to go along to get along. And it works. We're all still together. But it means that even in this place where we profess to love each other, and care for each other. Even here, we can't have those conversations. And, and I don't mean from the pulpit. <laughs> no, no. If I wanted to destroy this church overnight, I'd stand there and say a few things. <laughs> no, no, no I, I just mean, even in a place where we suppo are supposed to love and care for each other unto death, we just keep shtum. We don't talk. We're not authentic. We haven't learned, even here, how to have those difficult conversations, but to do it in love. How to speak the truth, but to speak it, not shout it. So if we're failing to do that, and we all love each other, what hope does the country have or the world have? I mean, if we can't talk nicely, if we can't agree to differ, if we can't agree to discuss without demonizing, if we can't do that, how can everyone else do it? It has to begin with us, though. I mean, there's no other choice. It's, it's not going to spontaneously happen somewhere out of thin air. If, if there's going to be a healing, then we have to be part of it. Because if not us, who? If not here, where? If not now, when? As one famous politician once rhetorically asked. I don't think any of us are miracle workers. But here's some things we can do. We can disagree with someone without demonizing them. We can tell people when they're wrong without telling them they're useless. We can do what our parents taught us to do, which is put a guard on your tongue. I don't know about your parents. My parents weren't politically correct. They didn't live in some halcyon time. They just required that you watch your language, Kenneth. Watch your tone of, don't take that tone of voice with me, young man. Oh, if I had a pound for every time. I can hear you rolling your eyes, stop it. You know, we, we, were, we were taught, we, we know this. We were taught how to do this. We were taught how to treat each other with respect and care and kindness and dignity. We were taught not to dismiss the other. We were taught not to make a disposable something of the other. We were taught better. We don't have to claim some political correctness. We just have to listen to our mums and dads and our grandparents. They taught us this. We know it. We've just forgotten how to do it. No matter what party we belong to, we need to speak up and tell those in our political parties who don't know how to have a civil dialogue that they need to start learning it. We've got to call people to account. 
ourselves, our family members, our politicians. We need to stand up and say, hey, I'll vote for you. You've got to, you've got to tone that down. You've got to stop saying that. You've got to start talking the way I'm sure your grandmother taught you to talk. We'll, we'll disagree over policies. But we can no longer allow each other to be disposable. No longer allow each other to be collateral damage. No longer allow each other to be on the wrong end of the barrel of some crazed fanatic. It has to start with us. There's things we have to say yes to and things we have to say no to. It starts with us. With what we say and do and what we allow others around us to say and do and what we allow others who are our political allies to say and do. It has to start with us. It won't start anywhere else. It won't start any other time, any other time. Us here now. Because the gospel tells us what last night's news feed told us. That we're always just this far away from our best intentions turning into acts of horror. We're always just this far away from loving the other or wiping out the other. We're this far away from being able to lay hold to the truth and to righteousness. But we're also just this far away from making someone else disposable, worthless, meaningless. Now this is how the sermon was going to end. We are called to enter into the dance. The choice facing us is it going to be a dance of life and love? Or is it going to be a dance of death? We can't sit out the dance. But we can choose the steps.